hands. This is good. And I was talking to David about our top, and I see Bill Ochester and Mike Hager are, are on. So they're they're the local Pennsylvania guys. So this is great. Um, so um, some of you already know David Young. He's a PhD and the new director of the Delaware Historical Society down on Market Street in Wilmington. Um, he served as the executive director of Clifton, which is in Germantown. So if you guys from our top, you'll know right where it is, right? Come down past William Jean's Library down Joshua Hill Road, and then turn east and you'll come to it. <laughs> so uh, he's just got a book out, which is partly about the Rev War, but also about bringing together the community to save these very important places. and. It's it's so it's so timely and there's Bob and Kathy so this is all good okay <laughs> I can so we're um, we're excited because with the two fiftieth anniversary of the Revolutionary War coming up we're we're hoping to to grow our uh, community of Rev War specialists and as some of you know Sil Wolford is on the um, the Delaware Heritage Commission so we're bringing him in as much as I can to the um, the W3R which is the Yorktown campaign so um, David is a, a really important player in Philadelphia and in Delaware he used to be uh, executive director of the Johnson House historic site which was uh, an intact place on the Underground Railroad and of Salem County Historical Society in Salem, New Jersey. And he was director of education at the um, Atwater Kent. He has a, a doctorate and a master of arts in history from Ohio State, bachelor of arts in German studies from Northwestern. And he's a member of the National Landmark Committee, advisory board of the National Park Service, and has served as a lecturer in the graduate programs in the historic preservation um, unit of the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm really pleased he agreed to speak for us. I think it's pretty neat. So over to you, David. And everybody put your mutes on. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, it, uh, it, thank you for sharing this beautiful day in the Mid-Atlantic and this uh, uh, Saturday evening. Uh, I hope it's date night for you uh, to talk about uh, history. And I uh, particularly wanna thank Kim Burdick for having me uh, in effect, to speak to the Revolutionary War Roundtable and the Hale Burns House, which has so many programs throughout the year. I think, Kim, you contacted me about this program about a year ago. So you really wanted to get us in there, knowing what a great year 2020 was going to be, and how, uh, how busy we we're all going to be on Saturday nights. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, your, your, cont your contagious and infectious spirit for... Uh, revolutionary history and historic preservation is a real example for the whole region and you've been a great friend uh, to me since I met you at the Revolutionary War Museum in April of 2018 and, and so it's really good to, uh, uh, to be here with you tonight. I also want to thank Rebecca Fay, my colleague, the Director of Education at the Delaware Historical Society. Rebecca has been helping the Hale Burns House facilitate these programs and uh, we're really happy to do that at the Delaware Historical Society. And I know many of you are doing good work in your own communities and I wanna thank you for that. But let us know so we can help promote it on our Facebook or, or uh, uh, find ways where you can help uh, uh, make this pivot to digital engagement for your history programs. And I, uh, but all of us are in the same business together and that's bringing life to history. Uh, so I hope you'll see us as a partner in that. And thanks to Rebecca Fay and her great staff, uh, we can help do that. Our site includes, uh, our organization includes the Reed House of Newcastle, and the same goes with Brenton Grom and Becca Duffy there. Tomorrow you hear from Kobe Baker, our uh, uh, outreach coordinator at the Mitchell Center for African American Heritage. You know, I, I work at a traditional model of a public history institution, the Historical Society, the Delaware Historical Society. It's been uh, in business since 1864. It has nine historic buildings, including one historic landmark. And uh, uh, the business of uh, institutions like ours is relationships. So uh, uh, we want to help promote uh, the good work. And in this day and age, with status quo being the riskiest option, 
we try new things. Uh, and we have, a, even though we're a traditional historical society with publications, scholarly journals like our Delaware History Journal and uh, a house museum, genealogy, archives, research library, all of which have been extremely busy, even though we've been closed to the public, but we also have the Delaware History Museum, but it's not every historical society that has a center dedicated to African-American heritage. So tomorrow afternoon, you'll hear from Kobe Baker, uh, who's a really exciting uh, young professional uh, working with the, Dr. Stephanie Lampkin at the Mitchell Center. So that's my promotional pitch. Uh, uh, I wanna thank you for all the good work you're doing, giving life to history in your communities. I see some familiar faces. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about a book that has uh, uh, been the product of many years of work in making the Revolutionary War exciting and relevant in a neighborhood in Germantown that's one of America's most historic neighborhoods. I could make the uh, case that it is the most historic neighborhood in America. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, why Germantown is so significant in the way, as significant as it is, and let's just walk through a few things. You know, George Washington lived there. The first protest against slavery written by white people in the Western Hemisphere was drafted there in 1688. Uh, there's an underground railroad station, a Revolutionary War battle that involved 21,000 people, happened in 1777 in Germantown. Uh, George Washington's bold attempt to liberate occupied Philadelphia. Washington lived in Germantown when he was president for a few summers along with his uh, household and enslaved Africans. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's not Concord and it's not Gettysburg. Germantown history didn't affect, didn't change or alter the course of American history. What makes it nationally significant is how it has preserved its history and made it useful. And the book is really uh, not a military history. It's a series of examples of how over the last hundred years, making Germantown's history accessible, relevant, exciting, and economically beneficial, uh, among many other ways, has really been its lasting inf influence in preservation and urban revitalization, using heritage tourism, and engaging in new models. Um, it's, it's both a parable for how public history has been practiced and not always the best, and most it's often very exclusive, but it's also an incubator for best practices. So I'm gonna go to share screen now and uh, show you a little bit about the uh, book that I uh, wrote uh, recently. Uh, it was published by Temple University Press last year, but uh, I've been, I'm, not, I'm, I'm the new director of two and a half years now, Kim, of the Delaware Historical Society, two years and six months, and uh, the bloom is still on the rose. So uh, I'm really excited because I, much like the Underground Railroad connections, between Delaware and Germantown or the plantation economy connections between Delaware and Germantown and the Philadelphia campaign and revolutionary war connections between Delaware and Germantown. I think of it all as one big story. And the Mid-Atlantic has a great story and the heart and soul of it is Delaware. And you'll see some of the connections here tonight. Um, the book is not a military history. Uh, it is a history of how uh, public history has been made viable and uh, uh, by many different communities who have found their way into Germantown. Um, so uh, the battles refer to episodes of contest and, and challenges to make the history relevant as the neighborhood changed from a largely white uh, his, uh, uh, population to what is now 73% African-American and is the memory infrastructure, the museums, the monuments, the markers tended only to reflect the colonial period. As the neighborhood changed, uh, many people saw themselves as left out of the museums and the markers and the monuments. It wasn't until the 1960s there was a marker or a, house, a historic site for Victorian history and it wasn't until uh, 1980 that there was a marker, any kind of marker for African-American history. So Germantown has a lot of different contradictions that are worth exploring and contradictions provoke tension. Just like the cover of the book, which is a, a photograph of a modern art installation that covered the monument to the Battle of Germantown in Vernon Park as part of the Monuments Lab public history project, public art project 
in 2017. The artist Karen Olivier, a Germantown artist, was commissioned to reinvent public art in Germantown as other artists in 2017 in the summer, the summer when uh, uh, the uh, rally in, in Charlottesville took place that ultimately killed Heather Hyatt on August 12, 2017, when people were openly reconsidering monuments. And this is Germantown's reconsideration of its Battle of Germantown Monument. And of course, being Germantown, its installation provoked an outcry. And the paper called it the newest battle of Germantown. So it's like every generation, every decade, every year, every month, there are new battles in this neighborhood because the history is contested. Who's it for? Who gets to decide? It is not a, a, a military history as I've discussed, nor is it a comprehensive encyclopedic overview of Germantown. I wrote a history book in the first person. So it's really a practitioner's perspective of per someone who has run a historic site and uh, a scholar of the fascinating history of Germantown and what it has meant to urban planners, to antiquarians, to preservationists, to uh, economic revitalization theorists, uh, and, and, and to African-Americans and migrants moving from the South into Germantown. Everyone has found the history to be so fascinating that uh, each, each chapter reflects a different theme and in, in effect, Germantown's patterns of how it's used its history or tried to use its history uh, are found in other communities. So these battles, these episodes in the last hundred years actually reflect patterns that you could find just about anywhere else. Uh, I know Judge Cooch, Dick Cooch has read the book and he said, it looks very familiar. Uh, and that was the hope to show how Germantown has uh, resonance in other communities. So, uh, it, it really means it's a way to look at public history in a more effective way. Uh, each of the chapters uh, um, take a, a, a topic that's re relatable. The first is conversations, and it's about how uh, Cliveden and the Historic Germantown Consortium of 18 historic sites engaged in public dialogue to find out what the public needs from these historic sites. Uh, there are 18 historic sites in Germantown. Seven of them are National Historic Landmarks. Germantown Avenue uh, is a national uh, historic landmark district, the first, one of the first two ever so designated in, in 1965, along with Annapolis. And in 1935, the Historic American Building Survey started in Germantown. So the conversations of how to make this kind of history exciting and relevant uh, is the subject of the first chapter. The second is about amnesia and how the visit of the Harlem Renaissance to Germantown in 1928 was forgotten uh, in, a, in a place that it, it takes pride in remembering its history. Why was the stellar week-long festival of history of African-American history, literature, and culture forgotten? Um, and it was as important in many ways bringing superstars of the Harlem Renaissance into Philadelphia as the superstars of the revolution at the Battle of Germantown in 1777. So that's the second chapter. Uh, by the way, the, the Harlem Renaissance came in 1928 to, in part to combat the rise of the KKK in Germantown. And in 1928, Germantown had the highest membership of the Ku Klux Klan of any section of Philadelphia. Uh, crosses were burned on Cliveden Street in the 1940s. So this is the kind of history, if you're trying to make a revolutionary house museum that is also the home of a slave owner, Cliveden, uh, the home of Benjamin Chu, trying to make relevant, you'd like to know that kind of history. The third chapter is about authority, and it's about the mid-century effort to recreate a, a colonial Williamstown-like experience in Germantown using an idealized version of Germantown's colonial past and effectively re removing and relocating historic buildings for a colonial Williamsburg experience. It tore the community apart, and in many ways it helps explain why Germantown looks the way it does now, where many storefronts are closed, where 34% uh, live at or below the poverty line. The latest battle is who cleans up the streets on the commercial corridor. Um, but the authority is who gets to decide which history is important. Uh, it's sort of like at Cliveden, which is located on Cliveden Street, who gets to determine how it's pronounced. And uh, we've come to uh, enjoy both sounds, uh, the sound of both words. 
The fourth chapter is about integrity. And in part, uh, it, it's the story of how the Johnson House, the 1768 building built by the same man who built Cliveden, uh, um, how the Johnson, and also a building that survived sus, sus, uh, substantial damage during the revolution became an Underground Railroad National Historic Landmark. The uncovering of those layers of history meant its period of significance was much different than only the revolutionary. Chapter four involves some detective work, but also how African-American history became represented in Germantown in, in what by the 1970s and 1980s, when this research uncovered that, uh, the Underground Railroad in, in, at the Johnson House. Um, it was a largely African-American community, so it established a newer kind of integrity for all of historic Germantown. The fifth chapter is about empty buildings in Germantown, and it's called Projections. And some of those empty buildings are colonial uh, house museums that closed and were found, and, and, and through a process, were responsibly managed to private hands. Uh, one is about Germantown Hall, which stands vacant. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and several other buildings as well uh, that were torn down to make way for a potter's field uh, on the site, or for new housing on the site of a potter's field, but also Cliveden 1767 kitchen. So conversations, amnesia, authority, integrity, and projections are the kinds of things that we do in our work in public history and preservation all the time. And when we do it, we're reflecting on our own role in the past. And that's what the cover represents. And it was a provocative art installation in 2017 that caused an uproar because it was right before Cliveden was to reenact the Battle of Germantown, which it does on the first Saturday of every October in, uh, in Philadelphia. This year, there was a modified version without the battle reenactment, but all the sites were open and there were a lot of demonstrations and, and engagement, and, and I know uh, hundreds of people turned out rather than the usual thousands that come out to see Philadelphia's loudest block party. So next year, definitely. So um, effective public history really means telling all the stories, lowering the barriers to participation, engaging in dialogue, and uh, looking at the long history of sites, the whole place preservation. And that involves looking at perspectives that may not be your own about the past. And uh, the Revolutionary War is not the only story in Germantown. Cliveden, the Battle of Cliveden, or the Cl Battle of Germantown at Cliveden really lasted about three hours in the 300 years of Germantown history. So the opportunity to tell the bigger story and the, the, the larger experience, including how that colonial story has been told and adapted has become uh, you know, par an example to the rest of the country of how to affect change and affect how we see the past together. Uh, this is uh, the Germantown section of Philadelphia is this yellow area, uh, the whole German township uh, founded in 1683 includes uh, what is now Germantown, Mount Airy and Chestnut Hill, uh, which is up here. The book largely covers everything covered uh, that's open to the public in the uh, National uh, Colonial Landmark District from Upsell Street down to Stenton at Windrum Avenue in the Logan section. Germantown's population at the most recent uh, uh, township, uh, the township as a whole is over 100,000, about 46,000 people reside in Germantown proper, many uh, at or below the official poverty line. One of the things to know in Germantown is there are a lot of groups. There are over 39 registered community organizations, 11 community development corporations, 18 historic sites, 90 churches, including the founding denominations in North America of the Lutherans, the Moravians, the Church of the Brethren, and the Mennonites all have their home in Germantown, uh, as well as three mosques. But uh, there's, there's one street, Rittenhouse Street, that has 12 churches. And they're largely African-American churches. And um, there's, there's a, a, a Quaker meeting. Uh, and across the street is the Reformed Quaker meeting in school. Because uh, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, so says the scripture, one will disagree and go off and form another congregation. So there are just, there's a lot of parochialism in Germantown. And that's reflected in the history. 
Uh, and so working together is a really important part of the work that was necessary for effective public history. Historic Germantown was the model uh, of combining all the historic sites into one map, common tickets, common website. It's now a full-time operation, whereas before from 1980 till about uh, 2008, it was a complaining society of uh, uh, a combination of volunteer groups and, uh, and very different uh, um, parent companies. So of the historic sites of Germantown, one is owned by the city, one is owned by the National Park Service, one is owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, one is owned by an African American sorority. Uh, I could talk about many things in the book. What I'd really like to talk about for the Revolutionary War Roundtable is the three, some of the, uh, the, the National Historic Landmarks that were there standing during the Battle of Germantown, uh, and particularly uh, Cliveden. Uh, let me just ask a, a show of hands, how many of you have been to Germantown? How many of you have been to Cliveden? How many of you have been to Cliveden? All right, it really is Cliveden on Cliveden Street. Uh, it was known for many years by, um, uh, by all the neighbors, rich or poor, wet, uh, black or white, young or old, as the Chu Mansion on Cliveden Street. It's the summer home of the ben uh, Benjamin Chu and the Chu family lived there more or less, with you know, one exception of about 14 years, uh, for seven generations until 1972, when it was donated to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which owns the building and a small nonprofit called Cliveden Incorporated uh, uh, operates the site on behalf of the National Trust. Uh, Benjamin Chu's papers were given to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in 1982. Uh, there are 450 linear feet in the Chu family papers and about 20% uh, percent of them have been researched. It was the scene of one of the largest battles of the Revolutionary War, October 4th, 1777. And uh, it's a one of the high. It's a national historic landmark of the highest order of Georgian uh, architecture, which means symmetrical, no balcony, no front porch, and a stern facade. That facade repelled cannonball fire and musket ball fire, as nearly a hundred uh, British soldiers occupied Cliveden on the morning of October 4, 1777. And because the Americans under George Washington could not get the British out of Cliveden, his bold plan to liberate occupied Germany uh, fell apart. Uh, the fog was as much a factor in the mis miscommunications and misalignment of the troops uh, that prevented uh, Washington from effectively surprising the British who uh, were under Howe and Cornwallis 21,000 uh, troops were engaged in the battle. It could be heard 60 miles away uh, in, uh, in Ephrata and also a source uh, in Bethlehem heard the Battle of Germantown. So uh, uh, there, there are about a, a thousand casualties on the American side, about 450 on the British side. And uh, there, there, are many, uh, uh, there were many dead on the Cliveden grounds, but the battle sprawled out all over the neighborhood. Um, Benjamin Chu built the house as his uh, summer home, and it was uh, the, one of the highest style homes in Philadelphia, six miles outside of uh, uh, Center City, about, uh, uh, about a 45 mile horse ride, or 45 minute horse ride, about a two hours by carriage. Uh, this is the only silhouette we know, uh, uh, the only images we know of Benjamin Chu in his lifetime. This silhouette was taken during his lifetime, all the other images were uh, modified from this one silhouette. So there's a lot we don't know about Benjamin Chu. There's a lot we don't know about the historic sites. Uh, uh, and in many ways, it speaks to all the things we can't know about history. Uh, but the Germantown artist, James Landon painted this portrait. Germantown's been a home to artists, poets, uh, uh, writers, children's authors, uh, jazz musicians, uh, uh, an incredible array of talent. Uh, uh, many people trace their roots to Germantown, including Presidents Obama and Eisenhower. So uh, it, it really has connections. And the Chews were a family that had a, lot, had a lot of connections, certainly in Delaware and in Maryland where their plantations were located. Uh, Benjamin Chu uh, served many important positions, including positions that had uh, uh, Im impact on the lower counties of Pennsylvania as Delaware was known until June of 1776. 
and he was a speaker of the assembly of the lower counties. He was the attorney general, and at one point the uh, the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court justice uh, for the entire Pennsylvania province, including the three lower counties. So Chu was an attorney and a very important attorney who held just about all the offices you could in Pennsylvania in the colonial period. Um, and uh, as an attorney, he never threw anything out. So those papers uh, include remarkable documents about the building of the house, the furnishing of the house, and what happened to the house on the day of the battle. Uh, this is the house. And if you haven't been to Cliveden, it's a remarkable place. They've been having modified tours during COVID. This is the interior of the house when you walk in. Uh, uh, this grand entry hall was meant to impress you with the wealth of the Chews and their station in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, on the right, you'll see the parlor where George Washington, John Adams, uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, many others, the Marquis de Lafayette, were all entertained uh, in lavish style in, in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, Benjamin Chu, among the, one, one of the roles he had was the, he and his sons were the attorneys for William Penn's family. And uh, the, uh, he was an attorney for John Penn and uh, William Penn's other son. And uh, that had important ramifications because some of the furnishings came to Benjamin Chu as the executor of the Penn estate, including the Affleck sofa there. You'll see the brilliant uh, gold damask of the Affleck sofa built in 1700. I mentioned that Cliveden is owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which owns 27 other properties many of them plantations, uh, but also uh, in, incredible examples of American history, three presidential homes, a Frank Lloyd Wright, um, uh, the Rockefeller Mansion, uh, and it includes many artifacts in the collection of the National Trust, as you can imagine. Uh, this artifact of the sofa, the Affleck sofa, is the single most valuable artifact in the entire collection of the National Trust for historic preservation. And uh, Cliveden uh, used to be all about the sofa. But as my mother used to say, get off the sofa and make yourself interest, make yourself useful. So a lot of what Cliveden had to do was at 4,000 visitors a year, it wasn't getting many people only just talking about the sofa and the three hours of the battle. And even uh, when we rewrote the National Historic Landmark nomination for Cliveden, Benjamin Chu no longer rates as nationally significant. Um, so how to get off the sofa and make yourself useful in a neighborhood where people um, feel you're not even pronouncing the name correctly. So uh, that meant that we had to re-examine all the fancy stuff that the Chews had. This was their fancy carriage. They were one of the elite eight families that had a full coach service. Uh, this is Benjamin Chu's silk suit, which is in the collection. Uh, all these things are incredible artifacts and yet it's not enough to uh, build a lasting and sustainable model. Cliveden's interpretation has been largely about the battle until recently, and its reenactment uh, draws thousands of people in normal years. It's a pretty challenging, uh, curatorially challenging um, program to run because the, uh, the funder likes to have the reenactors fire out from the second floor to, uh, to imagine what it must have been like attacking the house as envisioned in uh, Howard Pyle's images and, and the iconic images of the Battle of Germantown at Cliveden. There's even blood on the wall at Cliveden on the second floor. This is uh, what is known as the blood portrait, which uh, is on a, a, a plaster area that has never been painted over. It was built, a closet was built over it. This is a, a magnetic image to uh, look at it from a different uh, perspective. So you can see what was purported to be the uh, blood of a British soldier drawing an image of his sweetheart, the profile of his sweetheart in his dying moments. So Lafayette came to Cliveden in 1825. It's, a, it's the site of a significant historic battle. There's blood on the wall. There's compelling history at Cliveden and it wasn't enough to draw more than 4,000 visitors a year. Um, because this is how most of the neighborhood thought of Cliveden. Only about the battle, behind a stone gate, and somewhere out there is this building. And that's Cliveden on Cliveden Street. Can we visit? Is it open? 
So uh, getting off the sofa and making the great historic history of Cliveden relevant and more effective for the neighborhood and meaningful and relevant meant a variety of approaches. Uh, first, the um, uh, Cliveden's context, and I'll come back to this picture later, is uh, uh, very challenged economically. Um, some of the uh, uh, efforts we took were to uh, involve the entire neighborhood and all the historic sites working together in a variety of projects that I'll tell you about. But um, the most lasting has been the engagement of the public with the historic content found in the Chu family papers. And these have actually a lot of implications for, Jar or for Delaware as well, because when we started the research into these papers and there were 400 boxes that came from the Chu family in 1982 to HSP, uh, to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, in boxes like this, many of them folded up to the size of a post-it note and needing to be unfolded and vacuumed by archivists in spacesuits. So it took a couple of six-figure grants to get uh, HSP to help make the family records more researchable. And now they are in a, in a much better way. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on it, but most of them are digitized. Uh, um, uh, certainly the finding aids are and the, uh, the, the finding ways into the enormity of the collection uh, is easier than it used to be, but it's by no means fully uh, entirely indexed or entirely uh, researchable through digital means. Uh, there's, uh, it's, it's record uh, number 2000 zero, or 2050. But um, these papers have amazing information, including things like you know, telegrams, recipes. Uh, uh, um, there's uh, uh, one of uh, the Chu uh, ladies, one of the sisters went to Queen Victoria's wedding and sent back cake. So uh, there's fat stains on the papers. The papers themselves tell amazing stories about how the, the, uh, the, the, the artifacts that we've come to know as important to the revolutionary and colonial story actually tell many stories. So it's, it's like not just that the sofa is fancy, but who built the sofa? Who carried it into the room? Who would come into the, uh, who, who would have to service uh, the, uh, in these uh, um, fancy tea cups? And even the papers show more information about uh, uh, um, artifacts like this. So for instance, the tea service is meant to match the sofa. And the reason it does is because an indentured black man named David Wilcox, when the Chews were involved in the opium trade in the 1820s and 30s, uh, one of the uh, Chu uh, family members wrote to David and said, while you're in India and China on the opium trade, can you find a tea service to match the sofa? So there's an, an entire uh, tea service that looks like the Affleck sofa. It's rooted in the documents and it essentially brings world history into the artifacts of Cliveden. But to tell all the stories meant we were going to change and bringing people in to discuss the plantation records and uh, the, the history of the, the plantation. When we started the research, we knew of one. We now know of nine, and uh, they include Whitehall near Dover, the home plantation in Dover, four plantations in central Maryland, and one called Swan Point on the Chesapeake. Uh, and there are even more uh, that have been found in Maryland uh, uh, from subsequent communities founded by free African-Americans formerly enslaved to the Jews. Well, uh, bringing this public landed Cliveden on the front page of the major metropolitan daily newspaper, the Sunday uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. And isn't it refreshing uh, to make the front page as a museum when it's not being sold, investigated, or shut down? And, uh, and yet, uh, it was a compelling but provocative way to be represented to the public. Uh, and the next day, we got phone calls from reparationists and people who had challenged uh, the fact that the Liberty Bell Pavilion was going to be built uh, and, it, and it was right over where President Washington's slave quarters were when Washington lived at the president's house at Fifth and Market. Um, so during the president's house controversy, Cliveden learned a lot about how to engage people who may not like the sofa. 
and may see the slave owning history as a reason not to visit the site. Well, what if we could make the content part of a process that allowed people in to tell us how to tell the fuller story because it meant we didn't know all the answers and it involved posing a lot of questions. So Benjamin Chews considered a founding father of Pennsylvania. How about Richard Allen? Is he a founding father too? How many of you have heard of Richard Allen? Uh, Reverend Richard Allen founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, Delaware claims him too. Uh, uh, and uh, Richard Allen is one of the most important figures in African American Christian uh, denominations. Uh, Mother Bethel uh, Church has become one of the largest uh, African or, uh, uh, Christian denominations in the world. He became a bishop. And he was born enslaved to Benjamin Chu. And there's some dispute of whether he was born in Philadelphia or born at Whitehall. But he negotiated his freedom either from Benjamin Chu or from Stokely Sturgis, a subsequent owner. Uh, and he's in the records, uh, fully documented, his, his sale, his mother Sarah, uh, and some of the negotiations he had to do with Benjamin Chu. So the papers tell us this story too. Effective public history would be making that process open and learning what people react to it when we ask a lot of questions. And there were a lot of people who were enslaved in related to Cliveden, but we couldn't put uh, Richard Allen at Cliveden. But what we learned was that the Chews were among the largest and latest slave owning families in Pennsylvania. Uh, well into the early 1800s, the Chews owned enslaved workers. Uh, we can only put about eight or nine at any one point at Cliveden. Uh, remember it was the summer home. There was also the townhouse in Old City at Third and Pine. Uh, but they moved around a lot to get around the, uh, the six month residency requirement of the 1780 law for the gradual emancipation of uh, 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 slaves in Pennsylvania. So uh, we learned the stories of individuals in those documents. It's one thing to talk about the cannonballs and the sofa, but what about the people who lived at, died at, worked at, or, or uh, uh, made decisions at Cliveden? And we learned many individuals like David who voyaged overseas and brought back the sofa. Um, and how to tell these stories like Richard Allen's connections to uh, uh, Cliveden, which include, started to become public and a real part of the tour in the 1990s, but we didn't know the extent. And we still are gaining more information about the extent of the experiences of these workers shuffling between Dover plantations like Whitehall and uh, Germantown, Philadelphia. Here's a, a, a Richard Allen uh, being uh, a, a, one of his records uh, in the papers uh, among uh, the uh, records. Uh, many of the records are also quite provocative, written in Tillman's hand, Edward Tillman's hand is a four page document called on the clothing and feeding of Negroes. Uh, these documents I, you see before you are especially provocative. Uh, these indicate the extent, uh, the length of the footmarks of individual enslaved Africans on the Whitehall plantation. So you'll see on the left side, it says a number and a name, two, Cato and James on one measure. And there's the measure. Or down here, two pair on this measure, Jim and Aaron. So uh, individual enslaved workers would put their foot down on the document and then the measurement by the overseer, usually a free black overseer, would be taken and shoes would be made. Even the documents bear the witness of individuals who worked during the colonial period. So how do we tell these things? Cliveden went in a process of concentric circles out to public officials and to neighbors saying, what do you know about our place? And uh, what do you think you know, of this information we're finding out? And it started a series of open conversations with the community that brought people together to tell us uh, what surprised them, how historic sites in Germantown should tell the stories and what are they willing to do to help? It, it was meant to lower the barriers to participation in ways that the president's house project did not. In my opinion, the president's house is a monument to contention with a lot of different sides arguing with one another. And it ultimately is very confusing. Whereas here we had a co-authored process 
of people responding. These conversations now, there's I, I believe 45 Clifton conversations have been held in the last 10 years. Um, they're about um, uh, updating the research and a, a, a speaker puts the research into context and then the community is asked to weigh in in small groups. But here's the thing, at each of the meetings, everyone is required to introduce themselves to a stranger and meet across the room with that stranger to discuss what happened uh, and what they learned and what surprised them. And these mini conversations then are reported back to the staff as a planning device. So it, it really is the community telling the historic site what they wanna know more about or what are ways they may help. Um, and some, some of the speakers have been about uh, you know, new uh, uh, research into the revolution, uh, uh, plantation uh, uh, cooks, uh, mulatto poetry, uh, African-American women in enslavement, uh, urban blight and how to counter it, uh, um, so sociological studies of Germantown by Elijah Anderson, the history of the churches, uh, redlining. So there we are at a Colonial House Museum talking about redlining in a community that wants to know more about how its history is relevant and where do they fit. We, all, we learned ways to pose different questions at Clifton and not suppose all the answers. Um, because even, you know, is the battle a victory or a defeat is still an open question. It was a strategic victory because uh, uh, the revolution, uh, uh, the Battle of Germantown impressed the European allies, but it was a tactical defeat. Uh, uh, Washington failed. Uh, are people like uh, Richard Allen Persons or property, are there loyalists or revolutionaries? W would you, you know, Chu, was he a loyalist or a revolutionary is still an open question. Or the fact that the public wasn't brought into the papers, was that preservation or neglect? I should have mentioned that in 1970, there was a fire in the carriage house of Cliveden that nearly burned uh, many of the, uh, it actually burned the carriages. It burned all sorts of artifacts of the Jews, but it didn't burn the papers. It's like we're supposed to find these and work with them. And it meant that Cliveden made a shift to be both a shrine to one version of the past and a forum for understanding more versions of the past. It meant bringing life to history of people who lived at Cliveden almost their entire lives, like James Smith. This is an 1867 photo of James Smith. And uh, what, uh, it, it, what prominent family has their formerly enslaved African uh, featured on the steps of Philadelphia's most prominent house, uh, Cliveden? This is James Smith, who was born into enslavement in Chestertown in, eight, in the 1789, purchased his freedom and came to live at Cliveden and work there from 1818 until his death in 1871 behind the house. This is James Smith a few years earlier, just juxtaposed his, him and his fancy duds versus him here in his dungarees. This is an image that Cliveden didn't know about until 2014. And uh, this is, is this, is this the Chew's site or is it James Smith? Uh, and he lived in the kitchen there on the left, the kitchen dependency. Uh, we know about Harriet Chu because of a beautiful portrait of her, uh, but Harriet Chu, Chu looks very different, sort of like Cliveden looks very different depending on where you're standing. Chu, uh, the, the Chu story looks very different through how its portraits can look very different, these juxtapositions. This is an image of Harriet Chu, who was married into the Carroll family. And at Carroll's uh, wedding to Harriet Chu, Charles Carroll, Carroll gave her a gift, an enslaved woman named Charity Castle, who was abused, uh, the records indicate, uh, including both uh, in, the, in the plantation records, but also in her court case. She sued to stay at Clifton in 1814. And her case went all the way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, argued by some of the founders of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. But we don't know what happened to her. She was ordered back to Maryland and she didn't go. So we don't know everything we want to, but this image of Harriet Chu looks different when you understand that both Harriet and Charity Castle wanted to get away from Charles Carroll. And those stories became part of an important project allowing the community in in a different way. We let the Philadelphia young playwrights work with the Chu family history in the plantation and all the records, all the archives to tell a history of the of 100 years in Cliveden with James Smith leading 
uh, um, a, an immersive experience to the house. They, this has been going on for seven years now, and even during COVID, they were able to stage it virtually, which was remarkable. But it's all written by teenagers using the documents, and they worked with historians like Randall Miller and Erica Dunbar, who are on the Clifton board, and staff members like me and the preservation director. The students, uh, the, the playwrights actually opened the house and gave tours, and they workshopped the site to come up with, they workshopped the play to come up with a, a dramatic experience in a script called Liberty to Go to Sea, which is a direct quote from an enslaved man writing to Benjamin Chu, asking permission to go to see his wife on another plantation. These are human stories with choices uh, included in the dramatic event. You walk into the, the, the building, um, but you also uh, encounter the difficult choices for liberty that everyone at Cliveden seemed to have to make, such as Benjamin Chu's giving up his house during the revolution, um, seeking liberty, like uh, 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 this is Charity Castle suing for freedom. She gives a soliloquy to, uh, whether or not to do that. And the people in the audience move through the house, but there's underground railroad stories that come out of the papers that are dramatized in this 50 minute program that's an, a, an immersive interpretation in the house that takes you through the architecture, up the slave staircase and out to the back patio. And then you become closer as a community uh, in discussing the, the, uh, what you've just experienced. It gets beyond the architecture and beyond only one story to look at the people who lived in the site and preserved it. Um, a, a recent uh, um, initiative was to look, preserve both kitchens of Cliveden, just like it's Cliveden or Cliveden, victory or defeat. There's a 1767 kitchen and a 1959 kitchen, and the 1767 kitchen is a known slave quarters. Uh, and when it was opened in 2011 by the Boy Scouts of Germantown uh, to Mayor Nutter, uh, became the first extent slave quarters in Philadelphia, open to the public and interpreted as such. It was the busiest building on the campus. It's where the stoves were and where the laundry was done and people lived in the upper floor. We've had Joe McGill sleep there twice. It's the only uh, slave cabin he slept in that's made of stone and of uh, two stories. But there's also a 1959 kitchen made of linoleum and looks like the Jetsons. And, it's a, and people used to be shooed away from that kitchen, but it allowed Cliveden to tell the juxtaposition of how historic sites adapt and how places um, uh, are saved because they, are, they do adapt and everyone has a kitchen. So it was allowing the opportunity to look at Cliveden through the varieties of lenses of the people who worked in the, the food service industry at Cliveden. Uh, and it, 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 it made Cliveden look at its historic buildings from a different perspective. Uh, and that landed us on the cover of the Philadelphia Inquirer again, but this time in the food section. Uh, and um, this is the colonial kitchen that it had been infilled and a lot of different layers were added in to these buildings. And it, it, we thought we were gonna go in and get a Rosetta Stone of a colonial hearth kitchen from 1767, the kind of which they had been so hastily restored during the bicentennial, this, this will give us more science about how they did this, but there were so many changes to it, we couldn't tell just one story. The building had too many layers. And when somebody read this story, which included recipes, by the way, um, they realized that their ancestors had been Irish immigrants who worked in the kitchen and the gardens at Cliveden, the Burns family. And their ancestors came to Cliveden and donated pictures of the family to them. They wouldn't have known that image without, they wouldn't have known that story and Cliveden wouldn't know that story without that program. When I got to Cliveden in 2006, the, the uh, logo was an urn, that was it. But now the logo is people coming through the house, coming through that entry hall and engaging the experience. Um, I just have a couple things to share about two other historic sites right down the street. Johnson House was built in 1768, heavy damage during the Battle of Germantown, dozens of people killed. There's a fence that was damaged that's on display uh, at the Germantown Historical Society. It still bears musket balls, uh, but it was um, interpreted and almost destroyed uh, three different times 
uh, twice during the 20th century, but the Women's Club of Germantown saved it after the Johnsons gave it over. And then the Mennonites uh, uh, helped uh, preserve it in the 1980s and their research generated the knowledge that in fact it was an underground railroad station during the 1850s. And the Johnsons who were all abolitionists had people coming from Delaware and, and the, uh, the Delmarva Peninsula in, in central Maryland through Chester County and through Longwood Yearly Meeting uh, and down into Germantown and out to Bucks County and out to uh, uh, West Orange, New Jersey, and then up to places like uh, 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 upstate New York. So uh, the Johnson House, uh, though it was known as a Revolutionary War site, became a new kind of historic site in uh, the 1970s, uh, 1980s, and in 1997, it was declared a National Historic Landmark because it was on the Underground Railroad. And the reasons we know it, uh, it is, is, a, is the subject of chapter four of the book, but it's built by the same guy who built Clifton. Talk about a paradox and a contradiction. Jakob Knorr built both the Underground Railroad story, or the Underground Railroad site, uh, and the slave owner's mansion on the hill a year earlier, but they're all part of the same story. And it was a lively neighborhood of Quakers in Germantown, although uh, Germantown had its fair share of slave owners as well. And this street goes right uh, across Germantown. It's called the Abington Road. It goes right by where Lucretia Mott lived in Abington. And these buildings were there during um, the revolution. And this was known as the Washington Inn. And uh, it's the kind of place where wagons were not uncommon as there was a tavern across the street from the Johnson House. And these wagons would shepherd people through the Wissahickon and across uh, um, Montgomery and Bucks County into New Jersey. So the Kirk and Nice funeral home used to pride itself on being the oldest funeral home in America. In fact, Benjamin Kirk was a key player in the Underground Railroad in Germantown, connecting Montgomery County and, uh, and Norristown into the story. Um, we, we uncovered a hatch during uh, the restoration in the attic and there, that's squared with some legends of people hiding, families hiding in the Johnson House attic and then going out on the roof when the sheriff came, here's a hatch to the attic. So the Johnson House uh, proves that you can rewrite history. In fact, you better because uh, status quo is the risky, riskiest option. And now Johnson House is uh, considered the heart and soul of Germantown. It's the only site that regularly increases its attendance and it helps drive a variety of different public uh, uh, investment initiatives through Main Street programs and community revitalization. So this is that image I showed you earlier of sort of the, the, the world outside Cliveden. You know, one of the first things I did at Cliveden was start a, a, a business improvement district, working with businesses to show that the history nonprofits were part of the larger economic revitalization goals. So here's the same building, now adaptive use, quality rehab, next to the Johnson House and right down the street from Cliveden. So it's a historic area with quite a bit of history. The last uh, colonial site uh, is Stenton and Germantown has quite a bit of history, but how it's been preserved and adapted and continually made relevant is why it's such a significant neighborhood. It has lessons for all our work. So Stenton is really the leader in the historic Germantown uh, uh, constellation of incredible architecture. It was uh, General Howe's headquarters during the Battle of Germantown, and it's owned by the city but run by the National Society of Colonial Dames in America. And uh, they've done a remarkable job getting outside of their gate through educational programs, leading collaborations. And they're at the bottom of Germantown Avenue, Cliveden's at the top uh, with Wick in the middle, uh, Deshler Morris House, the Germantown White House, many other historic sites, Rittenhouse Town, all pitching in their own discrete ways. Stenton has been the mannequin capital of the world. It was one of the first museums in, in Philadelphia, is open to the public in 1899, a very conservative interpretation uh, as the home of James Logan and Deborah Logan, one of the chroniclers of Germantown. But uh, it was saved from being burned during, uh, or soon after the Battle of Germantown, actually in November of 1777, uh, the story goes that a, a, an enslaved servant named Dinah, working for the Logans or enslaved at the property, uh, prevented the British from burning Stenton. 
And it was given a, a monument by the colonial dames back in the 1920s. But Stenton wanted to use a conversational approach to involve the neighbors in how to memorialize Dinah. Stenton is right in a, tent, a dense urban neighborhood, but it's next to a city park. And they built a community process to memorialize Dinah in a way that is a reflecting uh, spot in the park. And the, 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 uh, the question on Dinah's memorial in, includes questions. It's statements, not just about her fact, because there's a lot that isn't known about her, but it's questions about how do you know your name? Where do you know you come from? It provokes questions, and that's the effective form of public history that uh, seeks partnerships, engages in dialogue, and finds new ways of telling even the stories we're quite familiar with. This is not a revolutionary history, I told you at the outset, but effective public history is about the experience of more than just the buildings and more than just our own perspective on the past. Cliveden, the Johnson House, and Stenton have all adapted. This is a 2019, 2020 project. And um, it's made each of the sites more relevant, more lasting, and more economically sustainable while also being more socially engaged. Uh, all these stories are told in the Battles of Germantown, Effective Public History in America, because Germantown is a great example for many of the things that we're all facing. And there are many other examples in this, uh, in this book, which was, I'm proud to say, recently awarded the Pennsylvania Historical S S Association's Klein Book Prize for the best book on a, uh, on a topic that illuminates the history of Pennsylvania. And it was a unanimous selection. So like, when's the last time anything's been unanimous in Pennsylvania? Uh, I was just really thrilled that a history book written in the first person that connects many different stories uh, could connect to academic historians. Um, so I've gone on a little long. I certainly welcome questions. Rebecca will help us moderate the discussion. I've included a way to uh, uh, buy the book. You, you go to an internet near you. Uh, and Temple University Press published it. I'm very proud because they've been a publisher of public history books for many years and uh, an excellent steward of um, the kinds of work that has made public history. It put the Mid-Atlantic re region at the center of how uh, we understand uh, making history relevant in our country. Thank you very much. Kim, did you want to, um, did you have any questions? If, if you have questions, feel free to unmute um, or you can put them in the chat if you prefer. Um, Hello? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, we, I have a question or uh, uh, I'm familiar with uh, the, the uh, Solitude House, the mansion of Robert uh, Taylor in Highbridge, New Jersey. And I understood that Chu was held essentially a prisoner there during the Revolutionary War. He was probably considered a, an officer of, a loyalist officer of Pennsylvania. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, you're, if all those facts are correct, but I believe they're correct. Did he come back to uh, Philadelphia and sign a loyalty oath so his, his uh, properties were maintained rather than being confiscated and included in all his all those plantations and so on? That's an excellent question. Uh, and uh, in fact, he was uh, required, he, he, yes, he sat out the battle to, a, a, in of all places, Union Forge, New Jersey. Um, and he was, be he was being asked in the summer of 1777 to take a, an oath of loyalty to the Pennsylvania legislature. And he refused on the point of law that natural rights did not allow him, did not require him to take an oath. So it was a point of law and that way he could play very cagely, was he a Tory or was he a, a rebel in part um, because if he was a, a, a loyalist, his, you rightly point out Bob, his, comforty, his property would have been confiscated and he probably would have spent time in prison. Um, and uh, so that tells you how savvy he was uh, and he also came back as the Pennsylvania legislature became, legislature became far more conservative in the 1790s, and he helped draft a more moderate constitution than those Thomas Paine-influenced radicals of, the seven, of 1777's 
Pennsylvania legislative con uh, 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 constitution. That's the thing that uh, Chu did not want to uh, sign a loyalty oath to. But that meant he kept all his properties, all his plantations, Whitehall, uh, uh, Frisbee's prime choice, Frisbee's choice in, in Maryland, uh, the home plantation in Dover, his, uh, his uh, townhouse at Third and Pine. So yes, uh, it, it, the bottom line was a big factor in decisions like that. Thank you. I, I should interrupt for a second. When we reopen in April, Bob is going to be our first speaker. So you all come. <laughs> uh, we'll look for it. We'll be there at Bell's on if we can be there. Yes, indeed. Otherwise, we'll Zoom it again. So any other questions? Syl, do you have a question? Could I make a couple comments? Uh, Kim has drafted me into W3R. Uh, and and uh, Bill Conley is obviously the president of the Delaware W3R, and but I have been the only one who's been attending the national meetings. And as as David said in his uh, uh, book and in his presentation, which was an excellent book and excellent presentation, you're trying to engage the community, and you're also trying to do some urban development. And these meetings again have drifted off, and I don't know whether they drifted off or not about saying that the 700 miles of the Washington Russian Bow Trail goes through some very bad areas or very bad towns and, and, and that the celebration should not put blinders on and, and should talk about urban develop, redevelopment and, and so should engage whoever should be engaged to see that if they can improve and enhance uh, those communities, as well as engaging them in the conversation about the Revolutionary War. So much of, of what David was talking about that he had done in, in Germantown in, in terms of, um, you know, community development and business development and, and those kinds of things are the things that W3R is, is trying to include in, in that celebration. So one thing you should know, I retired several years ago from the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route, which is the Yorktown campaign. But um, the new owners of it, it's no longer just our nonprofit. It belongs to um, the National Park Service. And Johnny Carawan, who used to be at um, the Delaware Water Gap National Park is the staff person of the Park Service who's in charge of it. And he's up um, near Valley Forge and King of Prussia. So if there's ways to, to bring in these other projects, let Sil know because he's a spokesperson for Delaware. <laughs> Thank you. And a very Thank good you. one too. <laughs> good. Well, and knowing Sil, the operative questions for a project like that is for whom and so what? Yes, and, Don't and he's right. It granted that folks know <laughs> what that route means or why it matters or why 1781. And, and uh, that's our job. Uh, and effective public history is essentially a sales job. We, that's right. There are lots of words in our work heritage, trust, society, community, renewal, revival. We have to make those words matter because they can mean different things depending on where you're standing. If you're standing in, in Cliveden in the kitchen, it looks different than if you're standing shooting out. So history depends on where you're standing, for whom and so what. What's the big idea? Who do we want to engage? And my fear is we have commemoration fatigue, right? We've had the women's suffrage centennial, we were the 75th of World War II. It's about bearing witness. It's not about celebration or commemorating a date. It's how do, our, how do we help the public bear witness to this exciting, these exciting stories of individuals, heroic partnerships, amazing journeys or service. Charity Castle's story is amazing. We don't know what happened to her. It's also exciting when we don't have all the answers. We don't know the names of the people who came through the Johnson House. We can't put individuals by name as enslaved at Cliveden with real precision. Um, and we want to know more about other plantations connected to Germantown in Delaware. I think we're going to find out who came through the Johnson House 
by my working in Delaware more than by my working in Germantown. Mm. So to me, part of the job of WR3 or America 250 or any of our work in preservation is the, the engagement, the, 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 lasting work, the lasting work in our profession comes in church basements at seven o'clock at night or in Zoom meetings at seven o'clock at night to get people where they are, going to the public official's office and saying, here's what we're thinking, what do you think? And, and that, that, that's hard. It's, it's stepping out of your bubble to engage someone and then they'll, they'll have ideas. So that, um, I, you know, that can be a great opportunity, but let's ask for whom and, and why does it matter beyond just us as history uh, nerds and, and people fascinated by the topic. See, you sing in our song, so. <laughs> let, let me make a high line is a public park. Public history is the intersection of a variety of things. Everything I've shown you, young people, dramatic arts, uh, nature, the parks. It isn't only about the history. It, there are other ways that people can see themselves in it. The, the surveys of the neighborhood, people would say, can you let us onto the grounds just to take in the shade or play Frisbee? You know, so find other, we can find relevance in ways that may surprise us if we open ourselves to the dialogue. We like it. <laughs> Let me make another comment if I, I could. As, as uh, David knows, the University of Delaware has a whole new set of, of uh, uh, history chairs and, and history professors who basically have great imagination and, and creativity. Uh, and they invited me to speak to one of their graduate classes on um, the Albert Lewis papers. Albert Lewis actually lived, lived on Bain Street in Newark. And he owned indentured services and servants and apprentices, and they ran away. And he put uh, rewards out for them. And all this is is documented in an incredible. See, he was a good document keeper. An incredible, incredible series of papers that show you uh, six and seven year old kids being bought and, and sold, and kids running away, and then asking to come back. And and uh, in presenting this to the class, one lady said doesn't this make you sad? And again, we're trying to educate folks and, 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 and more diversified and whatever. And, and again, I think this is a, a, a comment that we have to uh, address because some of these conversations about slavery and about how folks were treated and whatever uh, makes people sad or mad or uncomfortable is the word. And, 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 and right. so we have to be able to address the issue of making everyone in the room uncomfortable and how do we overcome that in, in order to educate and in order to celebrate the history. Uh, you put your finger onto a very important element of our work and there's no doubt about it. This can provoke emotion. And that is energy. And that energy is, you know, the, the, the greater fear is apathy. And having reparationists in the room allowed us to see perspectives we might not have thought of otherwise. But it also prompted anger or tears. And um, that's hard to evaluate. Um, if you give a tour and I've made someone cry, did I do a good job? Um, um, but we also shouldn't be afraid of finding the, the feelings in people's response to the history that were presented. You know, one of the things about the book, so much about public history is about defining itself and what it's not. It's not scholarly, it's not academic. This is a book that argues what public history is and that is by embracing intentionally just how social and public it is. And the social includes your feelings. Part of what makes that play, Liberty to Go to See so provocative is you're, you're lifted, you're taken out of your zone and you're disoriented. And, and there's an important pre-program way to orient people to the difficult topics of indentured servant, enslavement, uh, uh, subjugation of women's rights, 
uh, that are that are all brought out to you by teenagers. Um, and what it takes is a group of people with a great facilitator through the New Freedom Theater, but we use the technique elsewhere and I wanna bring it into our work in Delaware. Uh, but you ask people to, for, for you, you give them some information and then you ask them to ask questions, but you give them, they have to ask for permission to speak, liberty to speak. But unbeknownst to the crowd, everyone, uh, uh, not, uh, two or three people have been already given secretly permission to speak and they don't have to ask for permission. And it creates a, a rank, a privilege, a, a disconnect among the audience. And that becomes kind of the orientation to, yes, you're going to see things that take you out of your comfort zone. Good history should provoke dialogue. It should prompt discussion. And as hard as that may sound, and it is difficult emotional work, many sites are doing it. So we can draw on examples and comparables. Uh, and one of the things in chapter one of the book is um, one of the great uh, comparables is, 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 uses the, uh, is a plantation in, in New Orleans that adapted its uh, interpretation for more of the experience of the black uh, enslaved population. On the, pop, uh, on the plantation in Baton Rouge. And uh, she developed, the director developed the five R's for interpreting difficult history. And it really is an empathy-based approach to allowing people to react to the research, to reconsider, to reflect, and essentially to reject if they need to. So many sites like the Harriet Beecher Stowe site use a kind of, um, discussion space at the end of their tour. Lincoln's Cottage does the same thing to allow you your chance to reveal what's been triggered. What, what's, that's a wrong word, but the, the feelings that you've released because that can be a motivator too. And so uh, you've put your, you've raised a good point, Sil. One of the things about the book is it gives examples of how you can do this so that it does benefit from the feelings that emerge when seeing things different. It is possible to talk about race, history, and memory with Americans in the 21st century without screaming at one another. And history can be a tool that helps us do that. So you know, it's through the partnerships, you get energy to do it. You know, and, and if WR3 is to work, look at what the university is doing in looking at their anti-racism initiative, they're looking at different ways of knowing even the history they think they know. Hamilton did that for the founding generation. So there are new ways of knowing and of telling as well as, uh, it, it isn't just about uh, making people cry. It's interesting that the Zoom bomb and the high point of our program involve Holocaust denial. Because um, part of how I came into my work at pu in public history was interviewing Holocaust survivors and effectively going into their homes and conducting oral histories with them and making them elicit really painful memories in constructive ways. And yet, yet so you have to be prepared and intentional and trained to some degree, we had young people interviewing elders in Germantown in a program called Germantown Speaks, uh, talking about where the segregated movie theaters were. Um, and so there are ways to do it where young people talk in multi-generational ways with elders, but they talked about the Vietnam draft or you know, the racially divisive strike in 1944, the SEPTA strike. Um, and uh, people are eager to talk about the tough stuff. That's the example that Germantown has. The Stenton job has done that. The Cliveden work has done that. Many other sites in Germantown have done that. People want to talk about when crack arrived or uh, when, you know, um, so in Wilmington, uh, you know, our work at the Mitchell Center, we talk about the 1968 occupation of the National Guard. We, we talk about the segregated school system. Um, so don't shy away from that. Uh, but it, 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 and partnerships can be a way to alleviate the pressure and the stress. But Montpelier, Monticello, uh, uh, the Tenement Museum, Eastern State Penitentiary with prison history, 
uh, have done it really good ways at involving multiple uh, platforms for how to convey and, and learn from people's painful responses to difficult history. Most recently, I was down at the Williamsburg and started a conversation with one of the interpreters about the interpretation of African-Americans at, at Williamsburg. One half to one third of the residents of Williamsburg were African-Americans. And it's only been 40 years since they really were represented in the uh, interpreter population. And so I asked the, the, um, the, the interpreter in the George Floyd moment, and we're all in this George Floyd moment, are you re-think, rethinking African-American uh, interpretations at Williamsburg? He said, and this is an incredible reaction, we have even thought about putting up a sign that said Black Lives Matter. And again, we're, we're in this moment in history. This, this, this is, we are making history right now. And the question is, how does this impact the, the 400 years of interpretation of history that we have already written in the history books and, and such sites as Williamsburg you know, which is a major uh, historic preservation site and interpretation. Uh, how does the moment again change their interpretation of African American life in Williamsburg? What do you say? Uh, he he said we're, it's a, he, he said it comes up. It's a discussion. We have well, to good. rethink. And then, then we should welcome that. Effective public history can serve the cause of racial justice. Not everyone in Delaware knows what Juneteenth is. Not everyone understands that there was 6% of the Pennsylvania population enslaved at the time the Declaration of Independence was written. So the question we would get most often at the Battle of Germantown with the big reenactment for thousands of people was really, this really happened? Sure. Hamilton was here? George Washington was here? You know, hundreds of people died, really? So that's, you know, I bet you didn't know is the tone we should go into our work for, but also with rigor, knowing our stuff and with the quest to answer for whom and so what. And the exciting thing is more, there are more people interested in all the history than you might think. Very good. Thank you both. And it is, it is really important. And um, Rebecca, I don't know if you were already working at the Historical Society when Jim Toman and I, George Washington Society, when we did the seminar on uh, Black Patriots. Were you there yet? So, I was there, but I didn't attend. Oh, well, it, it was pretty spectacular. And I just got a, a, a question from John Sweeney, if we could do uh, a similar uh, symposium on Zoom with John Dickinson Plantation and, and bring in some of those same scholars. So, so Sil, you're gonna be part of it, right? <laughs> As David do, I hope. So it's, it's just a kind of a dream in Sweeney's eye because he wasn't part of our little Revoir gang in, in those days, but he's he's all excited about doing something with Black Patriots as we're approaching the 250th. So, so still is part of the uh, Delaware Heritage Commission. So we'll we'll be pushing on him a little bit. But David, we hope you will be very much involved in it because your the structure of your thinking is perfect. <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you all. I'm going to note that you said that. I did, and you can, you, can, you can put it on your resume, right? <laughs> so tomorrow afternoon, um, Kobe Baker, who, who works under David and with Rebecca at the Littleton Mitchell Center, will be talking exactly about this, about Black history. And the, the Littleton Mitchell Center is in the old courthouse that's attached to the old Woolworths building. So we, we hope that you will all participate in that as well. And if you need a link, if you haven't signed up, you can find it on the Hilburn's um, 
website or and also on the Hale Burns Facebook page. And if you just send me an email, I can give it to you. But that will start at three o'clock. So we'll, we'll be very happy to continue this discussion with this poor young guy, right? <laughs> mm. So so thank you. And I really um, especially want to thank um, the Delaware Humanities Forum who has paid for this year's series. Uh, Michelle Anstein, who took uh, Marilyn Whittington's place when Marilyn retired, used to work at the Delaware Historical Society. So, you know, Delaware's a club, not a state, that's all. <laughs> but yeah, the I'm Humanities hoping. Forum and the, um, and the Historical Society have been just such a blessing to us. We didn't lose too many uh, attendance numbers by doing it on Zoom. It's been kind of a, a miracle, really. So, so thank you all very, very much and, and come on thank over. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rebecca Fay, for uh, handling everything. Thank you, Kim Burdick. It's great history, but uh, the, the lower counties uh, are well re represented in the book about Germantown. And uh, thank you very much for your support. If it can be helpful, please let me know. And you know you need buy Christmas presents, so there you go. <laughs> it's great stocking stuff, what I tell you. And if you haven't, if you haven't read it yet, I, I would uh, encourage you to go out and buy it. It's actually quite a pleasure to read. It, it was fascinating, and um, I enjoyed it. So made me feel kind of homesick. I lived up that way a long time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thanks for All joining right. us and spending your evening with us. Thanks, so Bye bye. Good evening. Right. Good evening. Good See you tomorrow. Everyone. Thanks. <laughs>